All right, everybody, everybody, my God, I got a lady on the channel. I'm so excited she's come on Strong Inspirations. Watch out now. Ooh -wee. I'm jamming like Jamaica. <laughs> oh, man, and it's cold here in Michigan. Oh, man, and all throughout this East Coast. But that don't stop these people from saying, hey, I want to come on the channel and share this information. I got to get it off my mind and let you all, my viewers, watch it. Oh, man, here we go. We're giving it to you once again. Straight no chaser. You know my name is Anthony Brogdon, and here we go. Woo -wee. I'm super excited. And let me tell you something, my friends. Just do a couple things for me. Uh, hit the subscribe button on the channel. My numbers is up. Our people are subscribed, and they're sending me messages. Hit the like button on this video. I know you're going to like what this lady's got to say. She got books behind her. She's looking good. She's ready. She's smiling. She say, watch out, everybody. So like this video, hit the notifications bell when the videos come up. And I'm doing three, four, five videos a week. I'm putting them up. And I'm not going to tell you when because it hit on my heart. I, I put up one yesterday. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. And I couldn't sleep. Uh, and I wanted to share some knowledge with you. And I, you know what? There were some other people up at that time and they liked that video at 2 a.m. I know I'm on to something. So hit the notifications bell and tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't do that. That's not right. Uh, how about this? I believe you'd be blessed if you tell somebody about strong inspirations. How about that? I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the good father on you. Do that for me, my friends. And now, now, now you know. Uh, how about this one? I just put up a video on uh, with a guy who's a civil rights attorney and a law professor. Very distinguished gentleman. I'm I'm excited he came on the channel. He said. He was a civil rights attorney in Mississippi. I said, man, well, how did you deal with that? He said, I carried a 38 in my waist because <laughs> them people was mad at me for protecting people's rights. I put up a video on the channel with a guy whose great, great grandfather was on the last slave ship to come to America. Watch that video. And he says when he got here, he only had five years under that, uh, let's call it incarceration, <laughs> under that enslavement. And when he got out of that, he really made a name for himself. And then they developed a community. This is in Mobile, Alabama, and they call it Africa Town now. It's big, it's jamming. Y'all need to watch that video. I got a video on the channel. How about this one? These ladies, their great-great-grandfather was enslaved. Boom, right? That didn't stop him from, be, you know, perfecting the skill and what have you. And when he got his freedom, he started a car manufacturing company in 1905. And his son carried it on called Greenfield Manufacturing. I got the great, great granddaughters on the channel. Search for that one on Strong Inspiration. And I can keep going because we over 270 strong. The, I'm telling you, the train has left the station, and now I got these good people like the lady on the channel, and they're 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 uh, they're hitting me up a little bit. That you know, I, I'm getting that some. I reach out to them. Some of them say, "Well, let's do it tomorrow." <laughs> oh my God, we jamming. One more thing. She's smiling. She's waiting. Hold on. I got to tell you, all my friends, I want y'all to come to my festival. Little old me, I got my own festival in Kansas City, Kansas. Come check it out. It's on the website, businessintheblack.net. You're going to have fun because I'm a jam. I like to dance the good music. I'm still dancing. I just don't dance as long, uh, a little older. And, and then we're going to, um, and that's Friday night. We're going to honor some of them people in the town. And then Saturday, we're going to have a tour and we're going to have a picnic. And I got the people from the town cooking the food. It's not catered. We're cooking it on the grill on site. And my, my weekend pass is very reasonable. This is Memorial Day weekend, May 27th through the 29th this year. And I can only take a thousand. So you want to sign up. Plus what I did was 
the, the earlier sign up, the, the, the least, the less expensive it is for the weekend pass. You, you, you got me there, everybody. Now, uh, watch my movie, everyone. This, I produced, I hired the crew. I, I found the people to interview. I did the interviews and it's good. It's been to over 40 cities throughout America. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Check it out, it's streaming on Amazon. You know, that big Amazon, man, he got everything. And then I got this book. It's called Black Business Book. It's similar to the movie, but got more facts. I know it's got something in here you don't know, and it's going to inspire you to know what you will read in my book. And if you know every fact in the book, I give you money back. <laughs> it's a money back guarantee. So it, that, that, that's, ain't that deep? I'm that confident. And then, like you say, some people say, man, I ain't know that. I, you just made that up. I give you the link to where I found the fact. I don't give you no commentary. I just want the fact to stand on its own merit. So please, everybody, get a copy of my book. Just go to my website. Everything I do, I put on the website, businessintheblack.net. Now, now, you hear me use this term strong a lot. I like strong. I wish I lived on strong street, a uh, strong license plate. I got a sign in my house that says strong, right? Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. She's a strong lady. Watch out. You'll see for yourself. I ain't joking. I ain't pulling your leg. Come on, introduce yourself. Thank you for being on Strong Inspirations. Thank you, Anthony. Hi, I'm Kate Clifford Larson, and I'm a historian and an author, and um, I'm here to talk about some amazing women in our American past, particularly Fannie Lou Hamer and Harriet Tubman. I mean, you can't get any better than that for can't strong women. Better than that. So now, before we do that, I, I got to ask a couple of personal questions. Where, where are you located? Where, where were you raised and that kind of thing? Well, I grew up in Maine, the state of Maine, really? and uh, <laughs> yeah, and I came to Boston to go to college, and I never left. So I live okay. right near Boston. Yeah. Now, uh, what's what's Maine like? I, I I've never been there. I do want to go. What what's it's Maine like? Beautiful. What's it like growing up there in Maine? It's Maine. beautiful. It's I don't know how to describe it. I miss Maine because I you know my whole family still lives there. So I it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. It was a great place to grow up. It really and was. it's beautiful because it's uh, surrounded by water and uh, yeah, the ocean, many yeah, lakes yeah. and mountains, and oh, it's got mountains yeah. too. Oh yes, oh, big really? mountains. Yeah. Well, what's the weather? Uh, uh, of... It's cold. It's cold. It's snowy. It's icy. <laughs> you get a summer from when to when? <laughs> Probably July. No, I'm kidding. It is June through August, but it does get a little chilly towards the end of August. Yeah. Oh, through the end of August. Okay. Now, uh, if you don't mind, do you did? Well, how did you get to like Black History then? Growing up there. You no, know, that's an interesting question. I <laughs> I decided um, I have my MBA too. I worked in, for an investment bank here in Boston for a while, but I'd always loved history. And I decided to go back to school and get my master's in women's history at Simmons University. And I signed up for an African-American history course. This was back in the early 90s. And in two weeks, I knew I wanted to study African-American history. Really? And then, yeah, so that just put me forward. But I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, my, in my house that I grew up in, in, in Lewiston, Maine, in their attic, in the attic, there were all these, you know, drawers filled with old photographs and old you know, stuff. And I used to love to go through it. And one day I came across a very large tin type photograph and it was a, of an African-American man. And in Lewiston, Maine, I, I don't think there were any black families in Lewiston, Maine when I was growing up in the sixties, maybe one black family. So I'm like, what is, who is this person? It turned out he was a friend of my grandfather's and he was an escaped slave. He fled from North Carolina through the Great Dismal Swamp and landed in Washington, D.C. And a physician working in Washington, D.C., um, you know, hired him to help him during the Civil War and then brought him to Maine after the war was over. And he settled in Lewiston, Maine, 
raised a family there, and he was a painter. And my great grandfather was a contractor that used to build houses and buildings. And, and so he obviously worked for my great grandfather, and then he was friends with my grandfather. So that's why we had the picture. But he always, I don't know, there was something about him that I just, I, it, you know, my curiosity was always piqued about him. Yeah. So now the photograph is at the main historical society, mm -hmm. and they have a whole thing about him and his escape from, from North Carolina and the Great Dismal Swamp. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So when you saw that, she was like, hey, where this come from, I guess, right. to some extent, right? Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, yeah. let me ask you this. We're going to stay on there because you got me going there for a minute growing up as you did. How come you didn't grow up racist? Uh, for lack of uh, a better way to put it, I don't mean no disrespect, but how come yeah, that? No, I, I, I know what you're saying. I um, I don't know. My my Both my parents' families were just not that way. My, grand, my mother's family, her father was Greek. He was a Greek immigrant. Okay. And they were horribly discriminated against when they came to America and Lewiston, Maine. So maybe that's why they just were not gonna, you know, discrimination was horrible. So they just were not that way. And my father's family, they were Irish and the Irish were really discriminated against. My grandfather was like the first Irish district attorney because no one would vote for an Irish district attorney before that. So maybe that's why they just, you know, it's not worth it to hate people and discriminate against them. Oh, okay, let's stay on that just a tad. But then in your neighborhood, when you all saw the news, some of your friends, what have you, did they say disparaging things about black people? I never heard that growing up, I didn't. Oh, really? Yeah, but you know what, I, to, you know, I don't know if people actually were racist, but because there were no people of color in town that I remember, and there weren't really, um, because there were no people of color, nobody said anything. I don't know if there yeah, was a yeah. black community in Lewiston by the time I was a kid, maybe there would have been discrimination and racism that I would have seen, but it wasn't there to see it, okay. at least from my perspective. Now, so, someone else may feel that way. And, and to be honest, in the 1990s, um, Somalian refugees came to uh, Maine and Rwandan refugees, and there was a lot of discrimination against them. So that racism was there. It's just, I did not see it growing up, but it emerged when these families came from Africa, the refugees. Uh, so, but, but now Maine has some black history stories. Yeah, it does, it, you know, down the coast and it does have some stories. I just didn't know them growing up at all. Yeah. So, so, but did you ever see any, uh, as you, uh, maybe not in your town, but uh, some other parts of Maine where, okay, this is where a ship docked or right. black schooners, I hear those terms, any of that, had, had, did that ever show up that you saw? So, I didn't see that and I didn't learn about it until I was older. Okay. But my dad remembered um, there were a few black families in town when he was a little kid in the 1920s. But by the time I was growing up in the 1960s, I, I did not see them. I did not know them. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but but do you know of any black stories in Maine that, you know, now? Yeah, actually, learn, there's a learn. whole book. There's a whole book. Well, I can't see it on my bookshelf here, but it's about Maine Black lives, the history of, of African Americans in Maine. And they first were brought as enslaved people, of course, way you know back. Yeah. And then, you know, different there were different communities along the coast of Maine that had um, black communities. Portland, Maine, um, the largest city in Maine, does did have a black community and still does have a black community. Oh, oh sure. Yeah, I can't imagine. They got a basketball team. Yeah. No, well, I think they. In Oregon. I'm sorry. I think one of the yeah. oldest black churches in the country is in in Portland, Maine. I think it was 1808 an AME right? church. I think, yeah, it's one of the oldest, and it still stands. It's still there. They've preserved it, and yeah. So. Okay, I got to ask you this. This just popped in my head. When you moved to Boston, and now you're around black people, what was your? Were you afraid? Did you have that type thing, or? because of what you had heard or how, how, how was your interaction now that you are knowing that they're nearby? Uh, 
Well, I went to an all women's college and the, okay. I had African American girlfriends that lived on my dorm floor. We were all friends. So I, I guess I never thought about being afraid. Okay. I never. Okay. Okay. Cause know, I've, heard, I've heard some people say, and this is not necessarily in America, but maybe in Europe, when they see a, a black person, they've never seen one. They want to touch the hair. Oh gosh. <laughs> so, you know, it'd be like, hey, let me feel your hair. This is no. what you're talking about. But what is the oh, breed no. about it? So I wasn't so that bad. Yeah, so it wasn't that know. bad. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so so then you decide to do this history. Um what was your ha ha? I know you talked about that picture, but what was your was there a ha ha moment? that brought you to say, oh, I'm really going deep into this. I'm going to so, spend years doing this. It, it was a combination of two things. It was going back to school. I had two young children and a husband at home. And I the women's history was very exciting to me. But when I started taking the African-American history course, it was taught by Mark Solomon, who was an outstanding professor at Simmons. I had had him as a professor back in the 70s when I was an undergrad. And the, he just was an amazing professor and the course just captivated me. Okay. And at the very same time, my daughter was in second grade and she came home with a little biography of, of um, Harriet Tubman. And so I read the book with her. And of course I knew about Harriet Tubman and I thought, well, now I'm you know, studying all this. I'm gonna go get an adult biography. And in the early 1990s, the last adult biography written about Harriet Tubman was published in 1943. And my professors were like, that can't be. She's so famous. How could it be? No one has written a new biography of hers and no one had. So that sent me on this journey to discover her life. And then I went on to get my PhD, did my dissertation on her and oh, I have you? not. Oh, really? Yeah. And I'm, I haven't stopped researching her life since the 1990s. Uh, okay, so now that you've done this, what does that mean? No one has done a, a, a new biography since 43, but the, the person who did it before, didn't they tell everything or now new no. information comes to light, that yeah. type thing? Yeah, because he, the guy that did it in 1943, his name was Earl Conrad and he was a teamster, union organizer, he was a journalist. Um, actually, he wrote for uh, black newspapers like the Chicago Defender and oh, really? okay. the Baltimore Afro American and stuff. So he he grew up in Auburn, New York, where Harriet Tubman lived the last fifty years of his her life. So he decided to write a biography. So he interviewed people that knew her. He found some documents related to her story, but he did not have access to all the information that I was able to find. And Jean Hume, who was a professor at uh, UMass Boston, she unearthed a lot of information about Tubman as well. She published a book at the same time that I did. And it was, there was so much information here in Boston alone and in New England where all those abolitionists lived. And they met Tubman, they wrote about her and their families never threw anything away. And so all their letters and documents are in libraries and archives and museums throughout New England. So I had access to those that, that Earl Conrad did not have. And then going to Maryland to research her because my professors at UN, University of New Hampshire, where I was getting my PhD said, go to Maryland where she was enslaved because enslaved people were property and they kept records of property. So I went to Maryland and that just opened up everything because there was Tubman and her family in those records. So it was a whole story that hadn't been told before. Yeah, give me an example of a record that you saw uh, that really just kind of blew, uh, and there might be more than one, they kind of blew your mind. You say you saw these records. You saw yeah. what kind of records uh, and so on and so forth. Right. You know, so yeah. there, there are tax records. So a lot of people know that before the Civil War, enslaved people were were tabulated in the census, but they were not given names. But the tax records have all the names of the enslaved people because the enslavers were taxed on each person they enslaved. So there's they're the names of Tubman's siblings in the tax records. The big one that blew my mind though, was a an account record for the payment to a midwife to help Tubman's mother give birth to Tubman in March of 1822. So, they, so, that, now, so now we know the date then. Now we know, we don't know the exact day, but the payment yeah. was made on March 15th, 1822. 
And so 100 years ago, she was, or 200 years ago, she was born. And there's the record of the payment to the midwife. And based on a lot of other court documents and testimony at the time, it's long and complicated. We know that Tubman is the only child that could have been born at that time. So that's the, the record of her birth, payment to a midwife. Is, is there another one about Tubman that's a little known secret? Um, there, by now, we know a lot of things about her. But so what people don't know about her is that she, so she couldn't read or write text, you know, letters, yes. but she was a genius. We need to talk to her, uh, talk about her as a brilliant genius. And she had many literacies, even though not the traditional kind, but she could read that night sky. She was taught how to read the constellations. She was taught how to read the rivers and streams, the marshes, the fields, the forest, how to read people. She had to be aware constantly because, you know, a white master guy could come and beat her up anytime. So she had to be aware of everything. So she had tremendous literacies and she was a remarkable, remarkable human being, really a genius. What, 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 what do you think drove her to be that way? Is it, is, is, can you conclude so, that? Yeah, so uh, the reason that, well, she escaped like many enslaved people wanted to escape because they didn't want to be sold away from their loved ones. And right. that is what prompted Tubman to leave the first time because she was going to be sold along with her brothers. So she escaped. But she went back. Let me ask you she, right there. At what age did, did that happen, do you think? She was 27. Yeah. So she had stayed enslaved up to the age 27. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. So um, she escaped. But when she reached Philadelphia, it, she realized that freedom didn't mean that much if she didn't have all the people she loved right. with her. So that's why she went back. Now, I would imagine most enslaved people who escaped felt those same feelings, but there was something about her that she decided to go back and risk her life over and over and over again to bring her family members, her friends north to freedom. And that's what she did. And she had this profound faith. She was deeply, deeply spiritual and she trusted that God would protect her. And he did apparently because she never got caught. Yeah, she never got caught. Now, how, how did... Um... How did she know where her family was? Because she she had come from there. She had escaped. Yes. She knew where they were. And also she knew how to get messages back and forth to them without being discovered. Oh, There's really? this whole world, this whole world of black communication that was beyond the notice or the understanding of white people. And a lot of messages were carried by black um, mariners, sailors, uh, dock workers, because that was the super highway of the day. Everybody went by water. The roads were terrible. They took forever to take, go by, you know, the roads. But sailing, you know, you could get someplace pretty fast. So messages were passed through those maritime workers. And where she grew up in Dorchester County, Maryland, on the Chesapeake Bay, it was a maritime community. So she knew that network could get messages to her family and they could get messages to her. So she could say, I'm coming to get you, you better be ready. And she would send that message and then they would be ready when she arrived. That, that, that's pretty good. Cause I mean, you're talking about, it's a guy that maybe you know him, you don't, but you know, he works on the ship. He knows your, your plantation and he has got wind of your family. You tell him, hey man, I need you to tell her this. Uh, and you probably got to make it a long paragraph <laughs> to get a lot out because if you tell him one thing, that's not enough. Yeah. So you got to tell him to tell my family to be ready right. at such and such date, right? such and such time. Right. And when trust just, and when, trust that person to deliver right. the message and right. not betray you. Yeah. Because people were betrayed all the time. Yeah. That's it wasn't so secret. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. People were betrayed. Yeah. When, and so usually the, the date and the time was when uh, or dictated how and that kind well, of Well, so, you know, nighttime is the best time to escape because you're not going to be noticed as much. Right. So, um, but, you know, it just depended on, on when she was able to do it. And also she would have to work and earn money because it costs money to do a rescue mission. Okay. She needed money to, 
to get on a boat to sail down there or to get a train or to bribe somebody. So she would take a few months and work and save her money and then go and try to rescue more people. What, what was the, uh, the largest number of people in her family that she rescued at one time? Um, it was three brothers at one time. That was the largest number of family members. But then there were other friends that were in that group. Her three brothers on Christmas yeah. Day, 1854, she rescued the three brothers and their friends. Um, so there were about nine of them that, that fled together. When, 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 they, when they rescue somebody, uh, I'm in the cabin. It's late at night. And I, I, got, and I don't even know a, 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 how to tell time. How do I, how, how, how do you think that went? It's like, okay, when the star is up at the top, you run to the water and I'll meet you there. You so, got the idea. Uh, right. I think it wasn't as strict as we imagine. Like today we're like, I'll meet you at 10 o'clock at the corner, yeah, that right. kind of thing. I think it was, I will meet you at night when it's this dark, you know, they didn't have street lights then. Yeah, so, sure. Sure. yeah. So, sure. I think there was a lot of flexibility. <laughs> there had to be. Yeah. Because people couldn't all leave at once at 10 o'clock, walk out of their cabins to go meet her in a cemetery yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Right. So she probably said, I'll be there that night. We'll leave before dawn. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. She never gave that kind of detail to us. You know, it's, it's, it, I think the thing that's amazing to me, when I think of that life, I'm thinking that there is an overseer who's running around. It's like a prison scenario. And maybe that's not the case where there's somebody patrolling the area. There, there were people patrolling, so it was really dangerous. So they would have to know the schedule of the patrols, but they yeah. didn't patrol all the time, but they, they did patrol enough so you wouldn't necessarily know if the patroller was going to come by or not. So they had to be very careful and hide very well. They didn't carry any lantern because boy, if you want to get caught, carry a lantern through the woods or across a field or while you're waiting for someone to meet you in a cemetery, no lanterns. So they're doing it in the dark and they're hiding and, and listening. They listen to everything. They could hear probably better than we can. Their, their senses were far better tuned than ours. They could see at night. So if you were to go to the Eastern shore of Maryland today and you go out in the, you know, the rural areas where they don't have street lights, at night, it is so dark, you can't even see your hand in front of you. Yeah, I've been there. Because our eyes aren't adjusted to it. But in Tubman's day, that's how they got around at night. They had to be able to see even in the darkest of the dark night. So they had skills that we've lost. She, she was married twice. Right, right. Uh, the, and the first husband uh, didn't like her lifestyle type thing. And that, that's kind of the story. Well, it's, it's tricky. You know, he, he married her. He must have loved her. He was a free man. He, he was free born of free parents. And, um, but she was enslaved. So it seems like they were trying to earn enough money to purchase her freedom. But by the time she was going to be sold, they didn't have the money. So she decided to escape. He didn't go with her because he was a free man. If he was caught, he would be sold into slavery. I mean, that's a tough decision for a guy oh, to make. Sure. So she flees. She came back well, two years later. Though. Okay, he's free. Why he can just go where he want to go? Then what do you, what, he, what do you mean by he didn't he get caught? He, yeah, he could. Eating yeah, a, he could have gotten caught, but he and then he could have gone to meet her, but he didn't. So I don't, I don't know what their relationship was like when she left. Who knows? Yeah, but he yeah. did marry a free woman after Tubman left. Oh, and she okay. came back. Yes, she came back. Tubman came back two years after she escaped in 1851. And she brought a new suit of clothes to give to her husband, John, and say, come with me to Philadelphia. But she discovered he was married to somebody else. So I don't know what she did with the clothes, but yeah, she yeah, gathered yeah. a group of people and they she helped them escape. It, what, it, let's delve into this just a tad. You said he was free and she wasn't. What's that dynamic like? And I've had somebody else on the channel say that was that. He, he's not living with her in the cabin, is he? Yeah, he can't. Yeah, they probably they what we from what we understand, they did live in a cabin together. He was a free man. He was working for wages so he could pay rent on a cabin. And by the time she met him 
and they got married, she was actually leasing herself out. She was paying her enslaver, Brodus, $60 a year. Anything she earned over that, she could keep. And she was an incredibly uh, entrepreneurial type woman. And she was doing probably really great business. She bought a couple of oxen. She could plow a lot of fields. She could haul a lot of trees, that kind of stuff. So they were probably doing fairly well. And in, in the county where she was enslaved, ha the, half the black population was free and half was enslaved. So by the time she escaped, practically every family had both free and enslaved members. It was a very kind of that, that, fluid. That, that's got to be mind blowing. So what? So what does that mean? We live in the same. Does he live in the in the in the in on the plantation, or she does not live on the plantation? No, she didn't live on the the plantation oh, uh, with really? her enslaver. Okay. No, no, she okay. lived um, in another place. She actually lived with her father after you know when she was an older teen and a young adult. She lived with her father. He had his own cabin. He had been set free in 1840. He was given 10 acres of land. So she lived with him for several years and worked, paid Brodus $60 a year and she kept the rest of the money. So she and John, when they got married in 1844, they rented a little cabin and he hired himself out doing, you know, working in the forest, cutting trees or working on the docks. We don't know exactly, but yeah, there was a lot of work available for him to do and for her as well. Before we go to the next person, on, on that scenario, uh, so as what does it mean for her to be enslaved? Did, other than she could be sold at any time, what was her mm -hmm. life condition like? She had well, to pay this lady, or she, she had, had to go work in the house every so often. That kind she, of what, so once she made the deal with her enslaver Edward Brodus, she paid him sixty dollars. She could do, she could hire herself to anybody she wanted to. And there were a lot of people that would hire her to plow their fields or chop trees or to work as a domestic. So that's how she made her money. Not all enslaved women could do that. Tubman just was an entrepreneur. She figured it out. She but, was, but that was, but he had no control over her comings and goings and that kind of no, thing. No, no, he did. No, he chose not to. He chose not to oh, have control. Really? Over okay. Now yeah. you got me there. Did yeah. I see? Yeah. I see. And so that what that means, everybody, is all it's a great area on all this dynamic. Yeah, in this area of Maryland, definitely it was it was very fluid what was going on. Very fluid. Did did, did his did her enslaver own a lot of other slaves and he, was he, he enslaved? Did you consider his, he was a nice guy, maybe? No, he was not a nice man. He was not a nice man. But oh, really? he enslaved her whole family, her mother and all of her siblings. He sold three of her sisters, so he's not a nice guy. He sold three of them away um, and sold them away from two of the sisters away from their little tiny children. So he was cruel. He was a very cruel man. Uh, Tubman said in a lecture in Brooklyn, New York, that uh, Brodus was not physically cruel, but um, uh, obviously emotionally cruel. Yeah, and yeah. The, he, when she was a little child, from the time she was six years old on, he leased her to other farmers and they were very physically abusive. She had a, scars on the back of her neck and her back that she carried till the day she died at 91 from those other farmers who beat her. Now, what was the, uh, the, the, the head problem? Was that uh, just that a, was a, a, an accident. someone hitting her or was yeah, that, no. how was that called? She was in a, uh, she went to the local dry goods store with a plantation cook that she was hired off to another plantation in Bucktown. And they went to the store and when they arrived, there was an overseer who was chasing a young enslaved man who had left his job in the field. And the overseer was furious. And as Tubman went in the door, the young man fled out the door and she stepped back into the doorway when the overseer grabbed a, a weight from one of the scales on the counter and he threw it intending to hit the man, but it slammed right into Tubman's skull and cracked it. And she nearly died from the head injury. It was a traumatic brain injury that she suffered. Well, uh, as we come on to a close on her story, what would you say made her uh, beside, I mean, there were other people that probably came back and got their family, I would suspect. Yeah, there were a few that are documented. I'm sure there are more that were not documented, yeah. but there are particularly, yeah, there were people who would go 
a man would flee and come back and get his wife and children yeah. or just his wife or a woman would or a grandmother would go and rescue her children and grandchildren. But, so that did happen, but not often. And but no one did it like Tubman did. So that's, that's, that's her claim to fame to yeah. say if you got to have one because yeah. she did it as often as she did. Right. And she didn't get caught. She did not. Get and, caught. And, 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 and lastly, during that time, was she like a, a folklore? To, to, to the people, to, to the enslaved, and to just America in general, where America knew of a Harriet Tubman, a Moses, or something like that, and it was a mystical so, figure, right. per se. So only the enslaved people that were in the know knew of what she was doing and were pretty, you know, like yeah. she's pretty remarkable. But the white people didn't know it was Harriet Tubman. They had no idea. They, no one called her Moses then. That was a later name that she got in okay. Boston. There were some people in Boston uh, that called okay. her Moses. So it, she was. There was no mythology. Although by the end of the 1850s, some of the local slaveholders in Maryland on the Eastern Shore were beginning to suspect that there was someone enticing enslaved people to run away. But this is how twisted they are. They thought at first that it was a white man, a white abolitionist man. Hmm. And then they decided it was a white abolitionist man in blackface that was helping people run away. And then they thought it was a white male abolitionist dressed as a woman in blackface. They couldn't get their head around like maybe actually it was a black woman that was helping people run away. It had to be a white guy. <laughs> Oh, it's just crazy the gymnastics they went through to try yeah. to you know so now now as we uh the other person that you uh, wanted to talk about and and, and I, uh, i'm so grateful for that story about harriet tubman is is, is who fanny lou hamer yeah let's go for it yeah uh, oh. where was she born and what's her claim well, to fame he's another harriet tubman only 100 years later um she was born in mississippi 1917, the 20th child of Jim and Ella Townsend. Seven of their oh, children. Had, that. That's a lot of kids. Yeah, but seven of them had died before Fannie Lou was born. Seven of them, four babies in the four years before she was born. The survival rate for black children in Mississippi was horrific. Like a quarter of them died before they reached the age of five. From what? from disease, malnutrition, okay. Um, okay. just awful, okay. you know, survival. Okay. Okay. Yeah, really okay. terrible. No access to health care. Okay. Just okay. terrible, terrible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so then Fannie Lou Hamer, what? She what? survives and she's the favorite of her mother. Her mother, Ella, just loved her. And she was a bright, cheerful child. And she delighted everybody. She was really smart. She could recite poetry and passages from the Bible. She had a beautiful voice, even as a little child. So there was something special about Fannie Lou, even as a little, little girl. But she started picking cotton at the age of six to bring in a few extra pennies for the family. But they were poverty stricken. You know, most of her life was experienced in poverty. Um, her mother went blind during the Great Depression. Her father died in 1939, just as the Depression was ending. Um, but she was strong and she was really powerful, powerful personality. And um, she found a way to make a way. And she learned how to make bootleg liquor from her father before he died. And because a lot of people did that to supplement their sharecropper income. And um, but she was she was quite a character. She was quite a um, an amazing woman. She met um, so her name was Fannie Lou Townsend, and she met uh, Perry Pap Hamer, and they got married in 1944. He was a sharecropper on a plantation. He was also a mechanic, so he could fix farm equipment. So he had like a better position on the plantation than most sharecroppers, and they started their lives together. And, you know, she, after World War II, the civil rights movement started slowly kicking up in this country. And um, Fannie Lou Hamer started participating in some civil rights activity in Mississippi, which was incredibly dangerous because it was the really the most dangerous state in the country. It was just the white supremacists were just, they murdered people right and left it, with impunity. It was just awful. Okay. But she, you know, she knew things weren't right. She was, and and she talks about it in some of her, her speeches that some of her neighbors 
thought she was crazy because she would speak up and complain. And they were so used to not complaining because everyone was so afraid they'd lose their job. They'd get shot at or killed or whatever. Right. So um, she, she hung in there. You know, you were talking about your festival um, and cooking good food and stuff yeah. like that. She sure. participated in the Mount Bayou days in May in, in Mississippi, Mount Bayou. And it was like a three or four day thing. And she would go with friends and relatives and they would do the cooking. She like 500 chickens. They'd be, you know, right. barbecuing chickens and stuff like that. And, right. and they'd have secret civil rights meetings at the Mom Bayou festival days. And so she was, she was quite amazing. So, really so her, her big uh, launch into, let's say stardom was what? Other than those quiet conversations, was there something that she did that everybody was, said, hold yeah. on. So a couple things. Yeah, yeah, there were a couple things that happened to her. So she would have probably just stayed local and done whatever. But in 1961, um, she had had infertility I'm issues. Right there. She's how old at this point, do you think? She is, let's see, 43, 44 years old. Okay. And she and Pap had been trying to have children and she'd had a couple of miscarriages, stillbirths. They adopted two little girls, but she really wanted her own babies, like her mother had so many. Um, and she had fibroid tumors. So the plantation owner's wife said, well, Fannie Lou, why don't you go to Dr. Charles Doro at the local hospital and he'll fix those tumors and you'll be able to have children. So she goes to the doctor and without her knowledge or permission, he sterilized her instead. And when she found out, he didn't tell her, she found out when the cook in the plantation house overheard the plantation wife uh, telling a friend of hers that the doctor had sterilized Fannie Lou. She flipped out and went into a deep depression. She couldn't believe that he had done that to her. As it turns out, I guess he did it to quite a few other women. So she dug deep into her faith and she pulled herself out of it. And in 1962, young people from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, including Bob Moses, the great Bob Moses who passed away last summer, um, came to Ruleville, Mississippi, where she lived, to talk to them about registering to vote. Now in Mississippi, half the population was black, but less than 5% by 1960 could vote because they had those voter registration tests and all poll taxes. Okay. They just wouldn't let black people vote. So she went to the meeting. She had reached that point where she'd had enough. She knew she was risking her life by trying to register to vote, but she did do it. And when she got home after registering, she failed the test. But her landlord, Mr. Marlowe, evicted her from the plantation that night because he said, we're not ready for that in Mississippi, meaning not ready to let black people vote. He's a white guy, evidently. Right? Yeah, oh yeah, he's a white guy. Okay. Not a, yeah, just a okay. yeah, jerk. Um, so she decided to join the movement and SNCC hired her to be a field representative. And um, they rec Bob Moses actually recognized immediately that she was a leader in the community. And while she was twice as old as those SNCC workers, yeah. they recognized something really special about Fannie Lou Hamer. They nurtured her, they supported her, and she really shined and convinced people to stand up. And she was blunt and honest, and she called people on the carpet all the time. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and then she was arrested in 1963, brutally beaten in jail. Um, she was sexually assaulted. And when she came out of that, she said, you know, they've been trying to kill me my whole life. So they might kill me, but I'm gonna fight basically. Uh, and so we can all vote. This is ridiculous. So she became unstoppable after that. Unstoppable. What was, uh, uh, is there a pentacle in her career? Uh, uh, one in front the, of the oh, White House? Yeah, so, so she was, media, right. You know what I mean? she, so she was very powerful in Mississippi. She helped found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the right of the Mississippi Democratic Party, which was all white. And they wanted to challenge that all white party. Um, they wanted to prevent them from sitting at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City in 1964, where they were gonna vote on nominating 
Lyndon Johnson. And Hamer and her friends and, and said, no, they don't represent black people. They don't represent half the state. They cannot sit on that convention floor and vote. So she and a, and a bunch of her colleagues went and challenged. And so, you know, they all gave speeches and Martin Luther King gave a speech for them. And then Fannie Lou Hamer got up and gave her speech from the heart, no notes, nothing. And people in the room cried. And President Johnson was so, so, so shocked by her power that he had NBC News cut away from her speech so he could say something stupid at the podium at the White House. And then when they returned to the room where she was giving her, her speech, um, she was done, she was leaving. But NBC News had taped it and they played it on national news that night oh, and the really? whole country saw her. And it just, it, the whole nation was like, whoa, who is this person? And it launched her and she made a huge difference in the world. Huge difference. So then after, as we kind of come, almost to come to close, what happened after that? Did she leave Mississippi and now Oh, she stuck it out in Mississippi. She stayed in Mississippi. Really? And yeah, and while the all white party delegates were approved to stay, they actually left because they were so mad that Johnson even bothered to pay attention to the black Mississippians and they went off to vote for, you know, Barry Goldwater and George Wallace. I don't know, something yeah. crazy. Yeah. But in 1968, she was in Chicago at the convention and she was seated on the floor as a delegate from Mississippi. And she helped change the rules in the Democratic Party that all state delegations had to be integrated and women had to have seats on the floor oh, as no. well. And, she really fought for a lot of things. Some of them were still fighting for, yeah. like free school, education, universal health care, sure. you know, sure. issues sure. about food insecurity. But she was pretty, pretty incredible, really incredible person. Is, is, is her house uh, a historical marker? Are there, his, you know, that kind of thing in her honor? Yeah. In Ruleville, Mississippi, there's a, a, a monument, her grave site, a park. And um, so, and there are lots of places, there are some places in Mississippi where some of her papers are and universities around the country have like Fannie Lou Hamer institutes, okay. um, you know, voter registration programs, things like that. So her legacy definitely lives on. And um, yeah, I think she'd be pretty angry about what's happening today. It, so there's not a, a family Fannie Lou Hamer day in her town or something like that. Do you know? Of? Um, there might be on her birthday. I don't know yeah, about that birthday, so much. Okay. Maybe on her yeah. birthday in October, there might yeah. be a Fannie Lou Hamer day. Yeah. But there's a new PBS documentary coming out in February. A family member of hers produced it and um, PBS is airing it in February about Fannie Lou Hamer. So, so now you, you've written a, a book about both of these uh, ladies? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, do you have a copy of the book to show us and that kind of thing so we can promote it? Okay. There's Fannie Lou Hamer there. Walk, walk with me. See, I, I, well, I, yeah, on. You went then, too fast. Go back to oh, the book. Yeah, you went so, too fast. And, and, and it's titled what now? Walk with walk Me? Walk with Me, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer. And I chose the title Walk with Me because it's a, a, um, a Methodist spiritual. And when she was nearly killed in that jail in Winona, Mississippi, and she's suffering from the wounds. Her cellmate, Yvester Simpson, was there with her trying to help her stay alive. And Fannie Lou Hamer said, please sing Walk With Me. And that's what they sang together to keep her going through the night. Whoa. So that's why, yeah, very what, powerful. One more thing on that cover. What, what is that a picture of? I mean, I know it's a picture of her, but where was it taken? I, this was in Baltimore. She gave, was giving a speech in Baltimore. I think it was oh. uh, 1966. Okay. She's giving a speech okay. in Baltimore. And then, yeah. and then the Harriet Tubman book? That, did you the Harriet that? Tubman is called Bound for the Promised Land about Harriet Tubman. Hold it down to the glare. Yeah, oh, okay. I guess you can see it. It's called what now? Bound for the Promised Land. Yeah. When, when, one more thing on the last on the Harry Tubman. I, it seems like every picture is the same. Is, is there, I, I, have you been able to find like five <laughs> pictures of Harriet Tubman? Because she looked kind of homely in them. Oh, I know, I know. And I so there's, I'm going right. to erase this, but I really don't want her on the $20 bill. No, 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 no. Oh, <laughs> you know, is there a cute so, uh, of Harriet Tubman somewhere? Oh, and those old white guys are are, are so attractive. Uh-uh, yeah. yuck. Yeah. Um, 
so there is and there were only like six photographs that we knew of her okay. um but in 2018 17 18 a new photograph of hers was discovered and sold at auction for hundred and sixty thousand dollars and it's a beautiful young Harriet Tubman, and it's just it's okay. Been, okay, now we yeah. put that one on the twenty. I know. <laughs> well, the yeah. Don't look. Yeah, that, I might not want a twenty dollar bill. It's actually the design. I've seen the design for the twenty, and it's beautiful. Oh, it's is really, it? oh really? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, let, let let what I said be a joke, everybody. Okay, all right. Um, how do people? You want the first one? You have a website and that kind of I thing. I do. You can find out and follow you. Yeah, it's Kate Clifford Larson, L A R S O N dot com. Okay. Um, are you, uh, lastly, what's next for you? I mean, you've written these. You Are you still delving into their lives, looking for more? Are you going into another direction with another person? Can I ask that? So I still research Harriet Tubman's life every day, and I'm still contributing to the body of knowledge that we have about her. Um, and I will continue to do that a little bit on Fannie Lou Hamer, but I'm I I haven't decided on the next project yet. It's okay. Harriet Tubman's 200th um, birthday coming up, so I'm very focused on Tubman for the next two or three months, and taking you know doing lectures about Fannie Lou Hamer, and then I'll figure out what I want to do next after that. On that 200th anniversary, is that go, is there a celebration? Do you know? Is there that, are thing happening. There are in Maryland, they've got like four days of celebrations in early March in Auburn, New York, where she spent the last 50 years of her life and where she died in 2000 and uh, 1913. They're doing celebrations and the state of Maryland actually is hosting uh, programs and events right through till the end of September uh, next fall. Okay. So if you check out Maryland tourism, they'll okay. they'll see all sorts of things okay. going on. And, 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 and they're saying the 200 because she was born in 1822. 22, right. Gotcha. Boom. The midwife uh, payment. Thank you so very much for coming on the channel. You have blown my mind. I got no more questions. <laughs> I got nothing else. Uh, I, there's another lady who's come on there, uh, a Rochelle Bush out of oh yeah, Saint, yeah, out of Saint Catherine, Canada, whose great grandfather, great great, cup two three greats or so, was her minister, and she shares the story, and, and uh, about Harriet. Uh, I, thank you so very much, uh, everybody. This me. is what I do with strong inspirations. I find these geniuses, <laughs> these experts, these horror stories that somehow. Their life has been converted from what they were doing to what they were called to do. And they come on the channel. I, 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 man, the train has left the station on Strong Inspirations. And so hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the notifications bell, tell somebody about Strong Inspiration, and follow this lady. Uh, get, get a copy of her book. Your books are available on Amazon, I suspect, right? Yes. And, yes. And, and, and but definitely skip the big man, go to the website. I know you sell them there too. <laughs> yeah, get him out the way, give her more money. And I say the same thing for me. Um, and so uh thank you for coming on the channel. And I say this with all sincerity, and I truly mean this. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, that your life has been transformed in this way. And that you sharing what you know with us. With that, I'll say bye-bye. We out. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you.